Now you will be delighted to know we're about to go into three plenary talks, but after the first, we are going to have a break, so there is coffee, lunch, tea, and then drinks this afternoon. They'll all be upstairs, and once again, we will lead you around to make sure you get to the right place at the right time. So it's my great pleasure now to invite Dr. Steve Sturdy, who is from the ESRC Genomics Forum in Edinburgh, and who actually holds the grant for GenGage to actually address us on what is clinical research. So, Steve, over to you. Thank you very much, Neva, and uh, thanks, Anne, for a, a fantastic opening, uh, opening talk. Uh, I think um, Anne, I think, did a, a fantastic job of setting out some of the issues, uh, some of the questions that this conference is about today. Uh, there are fantastic opportunities for clinical research in Scotland. Uh, there are also important questions that we want you to consider, to discuss in the course of the day, to think about and to give us your views about what do you think about the opportunities and also the challenges for clinical research in Scotland. And my job in this uh, this talk is simply to try and give you uh, some background information about what we mean by clinical research, uh, how it works, and what some of the issues might be. I realise there are probably people in the audience who will be quite familiar with much of what I'm going to, to say, uh, but I ask you to bear with me. Uh, not everyone will be so familiar with, uh, with the topic, and I think it's important that we all start from a common, uh, a common starting point. And I just need to find, I wasn't sure if this would be brought up for me, so let me just find my, uh, ah, here we go. Where's the slideshow? Bottom right. Let's see what. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Is this looking? Nope, I've just entered a new slide. <laughs> I have five. five. Here we go. Right, there's going to be a black slide in there. But, so. Get started. What is clinical research? What do we mean? What is the topic of this conference when we talk about <coughs> clinical research? So clinical research refers to any research conducted on human subjects within a clinical setting. By a clinical setting, I mean within the context of healthcare provision. This includes hospitals, general practice, preventive medicine, and public health, the whole range of healthcare. And this is a very broad range of research activities. Clinical research is a very broad category. Many people will be familiar with the idea of clinical trials in which the safety and e efficacy of new treatments or of other medical interventions are tested on human beings. And I'll say a bit more about clinical trials in a minute. But it's important to stress that clinical trials are only one form of clinical research and that other forms of clinical research are equally important. So what does clinical research encompass? It starts with research that's concerned simply with elucidating the nature and processes of human disease, whether or not a treatment is actually available as yet for that disease. And this in itself <coughs> includes a very broad range of different kinds of research. At one end of the spectrum, it can include very close observation and invest investigation just of single patients or of small numbers of patients, and especially where uh, those patients might suffer from a rare or very obscure uh, condition. And so uh, in that kind of situation, where you're investigating a patient with a rare condition, the overlap between research and simply the provision of care and treatment can be a very blurry boundary, identifying what's wrong with one particular patient can itself be a form of research. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, clinical research includes uh, large-scale epidemiological studies conducted on large populations of patients, 
which can, be, which can be conducted with the aim of studying the distribution of disease in the population, for instance, or elucidating the various factors, including environmental behavioral factors that can affect health and illness. And in between, between sort of individualized studies and these large population-based studies, there's a whole range of different kinds of research that can be done with different sizes of groups of subjects and different ways of investigating the health and the illness and the processes of disease taking place in those uh, subjects. One important subject, subset of this kind of research is what's called biomarker research. Biomarkers are observable biological phenomena that can be used to predict the risk or the course of a disease in individuals, for instance, individuals who exhibit those biomarkers, or that can be used to identify individuals who are particularly likely to respond positively or negatively to certain kinds of interventions, ways of identifying uh, the ways that people will respond to, uh, to drugs, for instance. Um, an example of a biomarker, just to give you a couple of examples, one example that's relatively easily measured is raised blood pressure, which can help to identify individuals at risk of heart disease and may indicate a need to prescribe medications such as hypertensives, for instance. The biomarkers also include a very wide range and a rapidly expanding range of biochemical and genetic markers that can be of value in determining what kind of treatment will be most effective in treating individual patients and in helping populations. And biomarker research is a, a hugely important area of clinical research at the moment. Clinical research also includes studies that are intended to help identify new forms of medical intervention and then to test the safety and effectiveness of those interventions in human beings. And clinical trials are particularly important for, uh, for testing new medicines and of course are one of the most uh, common and one of the, the, the most publicized areas of clinical research. But this research into uh, therapeutic and other interventions also includes other kinds of studies that uh, might be helpful in, for instance, developing new diagnostic technologies or new surgical operations and a range of other kinds of medical processes. Finally, it's just worth mentioning that clinical research can also include studies that are intended to improve the effectiveness of healthcare provision as a whole. Studies, for instance, in the effectiveness of different clinical pathways, the ways that people move through the healthcare system. Uh, and these are intended to look not just at particular interventions or treatments, but at the way that healthcare is organized and delivered for the best benefit of the patients involved in these. And in all these areas of clinical research, human subjects are necessarily involved. They're part of the, uh, the, the raw material, if you like, of clinical research. And human participation, the participation of patients, but also sometimes of non-patients, healthy subjects, is vital if this kind of research is to be carried out and if it's to produce useful results. But by the same token, as Anne already suggested, it's vital that clinical research should be conducted in ways that are consistent with the best interest of those subjects who choose to participate, as well as with the greater good of the population as a whole. I've said a bit about clinical trials, and these are a particularly important, and as I say, a uh, particularly publicized area of clinical research. And I just want to say a bit more about clinical trials, how they're organized and how they're structured, because they do raise a number of sets of issues that I think participate, participants in this conference and indeed in clinical trials need to be aware of. Clinical trials, as I've said, are studies that are intended to demonstrate the safety and efficacy <coughs> of new forms of treatment and other interventions. And this applies especially to new medicines. But increasingly, clinical trial methodologies are also being used to test the effectiveness of other kinds of interventions. These can include surgical operations, the use of 
diagnostic te technologies, behavioural therapies, and increasingly public health interventions as well. So clinical trials are becoming increasingly important uh, in, across the range of uh, healthcare delivery. Clinical trials provide the most rigorous methodology that we have for determining whether or not promising new interventions are safe for use in humans and whether or not they're effective enough in treating, uh, in treating individuals to justify the cost of providing them. And as such, because of this concern, especially with rigor and the importance of the decisions that are based on clinical trial information, uh, clinical trials usually follow a fairly standardized uh, sequence of events. And it's worth I think, running through the different stages in clinical trials, just so you are familiar with them if you're not already. So phase one trials are preliminary investigations that are intended to ensure that new medicines that have already been tested, usually in laboratory animals, are safe then to employ in human subjects. And safety here is the key issue. As such, because the effects of these drug, drug, these uh, uh, treatments in humans are as yet unknown, they're usually conducted using very small numbers of healthy volunteers who are carefully observed to ensure uh, that as far as possible, nothing goes wrong when they receive the treatment. It's worth saying that these trials do sometimes carry a significant element of risk. And a case in point uh, would be the very highly publicized phase one trial of a drug called TGN-1412 that was carried out at Northwood Park Hotel, uh, oh, hotel <laughs> hospital in 2006, when six healthy volunteers suffered extreme inflammatory reactions, and you probably have uh, uh, heard about that, uh, widely publicized, publicized in the newspapers. But it's important to stress, this was a preliminary trial, these were very small numbers of patients, uh, not even patients, healthy volunteers, and these kinds of risks are very rare, but they are unpredictable. Hence the need to conduct phase one trials in very uh, controlled conditions. Uh, and because of the risk, uh, healthy volunteers are usually paid to take part in phase one trials. These are very different from the clinical trials that go on to produce information about efficacy and so on. Phase two trials involve larger numbers of subjects, usually patients with the disease that the intervention is intended to treat, and the phase two trials uh, are intended to provide further information about safety and efficacy, and then to help to optimize dose levels uh, and other aspects of the treatment before it proceeds to a full phase three trial. And in terms of producing information on which decisions about the uh, licensing or, or the, uh, the use of treatment uh, in medical practice is concerned, phase three is really the most important stage. Phase three trials are designed to pr provide definitive evidence of the effectiveness or otherwise of new medical interventions. Phase three trials typically involve very large numbers of patients, often running into several thousands. And these are usually conducted in multiple research centers. Phase three trials also usually follow a very strict research methodology that's designed to ensure that the evidence that they generate is robust, reliable, and can be generalized to other patients besides those who took part in the trial. I'll say just a little more about this in a moment. And as I've said, decisions about whether or not a new treatment, and especially a new medicine, should be adopted in practice are usually based, in the first instance, on phase three clinical trials. Less commonly, but with increasing frequency, phase four trials might also be con conducted. These are um, trials that take place once a new treatment has come into practice, and they involve the sort of continuing, ongoing observation and surveillance of patients to observe whether or not they respond positively or negatively to treatments, and especially about whether there are unanticipated side effects that might not have been picked up in the phase three trials. I just want to say a little bit more about the methodology employed in 
phase three trials, because this is important to understand. As I said, a major concern is ensuring the robustness and reliability of the information produced by clinical trials, particularly phase three trials. And a key concern here is to eliminate as far as possible any chance of bias in the way that that information is generated. Now, typically, phase three trials involve comparing the performance of a new medical treatment with the performance of the best treatment currently available, or when the current treatment exists with a placebo. And this is the so-called control arm of the, uh, of the trial. There's a, a trial population who receive the new treatment, and there's a control population or control arm who receive the next best treatment or a placebo. In order to eliminate possible sources of bias in the way that people are assigned to the different arms or the way that the reports from the different arms are, uh, the results from the different arms are recorded, phase three trials are normally so called double blinded. So that in these trials, neither the patients nor the doctors are allowed to know while the trial is continuing whether or not a particular patient has been assigned to the new treatment or whether or not they're receiving the control, the best alternative or placebo. So this double blinding is a very important element in the conduct of clinical trials. Now we're talking about today particularly about the impact that genomics is having on the conduct of clinical research. Up till now I've talked about clinical research in general and clinical trials in particular, but I want to say a bit more specifically about what genomics can contribute to clinical research. Genomics is tautologically the science of genomes, the study of genomes. And genomes, as I'm sure you all know, are the collections of accumulations of genetic material that every living body, every living organism has in its, uh, in its body, in its various cells. And everyone here has the genome, your collection of gen genetic information. This science has progressed incredibly rapidly over the past few decades, and especially since the inception of the Human Genome Project in 1990 and the publication of the first rough draft of the human genome in 2000. And in that time, we've learned a vast amount about how genomes operate. But we've also learned that the operation of genomes, the way genomes work in our bodies, is vastly more complex and more subtle than we ever anticipated. The science has produced huge amounts of information that's raised far more questions than it's answered. So this is a very exciting area that's pushing forward into uh, new areas of science, raising new questions for researchers to pursue, including questions about the health and illness of humans. Genetic genomics has also produced uh, fantastic new technologies for uh, investigating uh, genetics, the, uh, the, the structure and organization, and the working of our genomes. And these technologies in particular are of immense value in the pursuit of clinical research. For one thing, genomic research is yielding a wealth of new information about the molecular processes that underlie both health and illness. And that knowledge can be used to develop new treatments. Understanding what the processes of health and health and disease are enables us to design new treatments to address those processes. And clinical research on humans uh, is very important in producing that kind of information. Genomics, and talked about informatics, genomics is in many ways an information science, producing huge amounts of information, and the information that's generated is, is vastly important. Genomic research, for instance, uh, just to give you an example that Anne has already mentioned, uh, one instance is the uh, design of the breast cancer drug Herceptin, 
And genomic research showed that some kinds of breast cancer tumors are characterized by increased activity of a particular gene, the HER2 gene, which leads to overproduction of a protein, also called HER2. And Herceptin was designed specifically to counter the effects of that gene by interfering with the active activity of the protein for which it codes. And it's been shown in clinical trials to be effective in treating those kinds of tumors specifically. This points us to another contribution that genomics can make to clinical research. Genomic techniques can help to identify new biomarkers that can be used to identify patients with a particular susceptibility to illness, for instance, or whose illness is likely to take a particular course, or, importantly, patients who are, have a particular form of disease that might respond especially well to certain treatments. And again, perceptin is a case in point. Clinical research has shown that uh, has developed has led us, uh, enabled us to develop tests for certain biochemical or genomic markers that provide the means of identifying those patients who are likely to benefit from perceptin and of excluding those patients on whom that drug would un be unlikely to have any beneficial effect. And this takes us to a third way in which genomics can contribute to clinical research. And that's by identifying subgroups of patients who are particularly likely to respond to new treatments and so that the clinical trials can be focused on seeing if drugs are indeed effective in those particular subgroups. Uh, as I've said, uh, phase three trials involve large numbers of patients. In many cases, only a minority of patients are likely, of those patients are likely to respond uh, beneficially to an experimental treatment. So if we simply took a random case, a random sample of all uh, patients, for instance, with breast cancer, and we ran a clinical trial for Herceptin on that entire population, since only about 20 to 25% of patients with breast cancer respond positively to Herceptin, it's likely that the positive effects would simply be swamped by the number of people who didn't respond to it. And we wouldn't see any benefit from perceptive. So it's important to be able to identify target groups in clinical trials who are likely to respond beneficially. And then on that basis to identify that drugs, some drugs may indeed be useful if uh, used on certain subpopulations. So, put briefly, genomics offers powerful new techniques for explaining and understanding disease, for designing drugs and other interventions that may be a benefit in treating disease, for identifying those individuals and populations who are most likely to benefit from such treatments, and for refining clinical trials and methodology to demonstrate the presence or absence of such treatments. Genomics offers all these advantages, and as Anne said, it relies on producing a very considerable quantity of information, of managing that information about patients and about populations, and of um, analyzing and using that information in productive ways. But in consequence of this, all the science of genomics is becoming increasingly closely incorporated into all stages of clinical research from the investigation of disease in individuals and populations, all the way through to the testing of new therapies. One issue that you may want to consider in the course of your discussions this afternoon is who pays for clinical research. All of the work that I've talked about so far adds up to an enormous research enterprise, which entails very considerable costs in terms of sophisticated investigative technologies, high technology, um, this high technology research, including the informatic technology, the uh, lab technology, and so on. Clinical research involves the cost of caring for patients. It involves the use of clinical facilities. It involves personnel costs and management costs. So who pays for it? Well, by and large, and these are big generalizations, but early research into the nature of disease is largely paid for from public sources, and these include government research councils, 
medical research charities, and the NHS itself supports this kind of research. But increasingly, as we move down the research and development pipeline to a point where it becomes possible to test new therapies and other interventions, other organizations become increasingly involved. Specifically, where it looks as though clinical research will lead to the production of new interventions that can be manufactured and sold for commercial profit, private companies become increasingly prominent among research funders. In particular, the majority of funding for clinical trials of promising new drugs and devices comes from pharmaceutical companies and other medical manufacturers. And meanwhile, where other new interventions are unlikely to prove, prove profitable, and now has already mentioned the, uh, the case of neglected diseases in developing countries, in such cases, uh, public and charitable research funds remain the major source of funding for this kind of research. All of this raises a number of questions that hopefully you will discuss uh, well, we, well, will be discussed further in the next two presentations, and that you might want to consider when you break out into the discussion groups this afternoon. I just want very briefly to flag up some issues that I hope you will come to discuss. First of all, who benefits from all this clinical research? And are the benefits fairly distributed? You have a chance to consider and talk about this this afternoon. But it's important that we have your views on these kinds of issues. Uh, or thinking about how clinical research should proceed in school. Secondly, who should pay for clinical research? Is clinical research an appropriate use for government and chari charitable funds? And do the benefits to the public justify this public expenditure? On the other hand, should commercial companies be encouraged to pay for and to organize clinical research? Commercial funding for clinical research, and especially clinical trials, does pay for the care and treatment of many patients who would otherwise be treated, have to be treated at public cost. It helps to maintain NHS facilities and jobs, and ultimately, as Anne said, it makes potentially a very significant contribution to the Scottish economy. But it also means that commercial interests and the pursuit of commercial profit are closely entangled in the structures of the Scottish NHS. Is this appropriate? Or does it bring disadvantages that policymakers might want to consider and think about ways of doing? Thirdly, how are the interests of patients and other potential research subjects best safeguarded? What sorts of governance arrangements should be in place to ensure that research subjects receive the best care possible and that their right to privacy and to other rights are protected? And what role should research subjects play in the design, running, and governance of clinical trials? These are issues that will be discussed in the next two presentations and that you will have a chance to discuss uh, in this afternoon in the breakout groups. But ultimately, the important thing to keep in mind is that clinical research depends upon the willing and active participation of human subjects. So what sorts of policies and practices should be put in place to ensure that clinical research not only secures the confidence of those subjects, but also serves the greatest good for society as a whole. That's the topic of today's conference. You get a chance to discuss it in the roundtable discussions this afternoon. I hope that my talk has provided you with some information and ideas that will help you to make the most of these discussions. I thank you for listening. Thank you.